Tony. How are you, Michael? Pretty good. How are you? Very well, thank you. Thank you. Sorry if I'm a bit late. No, I was early. Oh, I great, 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 great. <laughs> yeah, that's not that doesn't happen every day that I'm early. I'm always fashionably late. Yeah, well, so am I sometimes. How are you doing, man? Are you are you in you in LA right now? No, no, no. I'm in Stockholm. I'm in Stockholm. Okay. We're pretty far from LA. Um, yeah, I'm 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 fine. We have just uh, rehearsed today. Actually, we're going on a tour on the the fourteenth of September. Right, right. You're starting with the the Baltics, right? Eastern Europe. Yeah, we're at, like Bulgaria. I think we'll be in Poland, Czech Republic, a few shows in Italy, um, Estonia. I think. I mean, yeah, around there, Hungary. I'm not exactly exactly sure where we're going to be honest. But yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I had that it, uh, neck of the woods. I had it written somewhere. You're doing the Baltics and yeah, a couple of dates in Italy. I think Rome and Milan. Yeah, yeah. that's right. Correct. And then you're coming back in November, this side of Europe, in uh, Western Europe. Yes. Yeah. Uh, November is the anniversary tour. We're playing. I don't really know where we're playing then either. I mean, there's some kind of prestigious venues like the Hammersmith in London that we, we never played before. Right, so right, that right. Be uh, but yeah, some, some shows, you know, a handful of shows to celebrate us being 30 years. And now in, in reality, we're actually 32 years old, the band, because, I mean, we couldn't tour when sure. we turned 30 because that was middle of, middle of the pandemic. So you had to postpone the birthday party. We have to postpone, postpone the birthday party. So it's a 32 year anniversary, technically. But that's fine. I mean, who, who's counting? Yeah, exactly. I'll see you, I think, on the 16th. I might be wrong, but I think on the 16th, you'll be playing Paris. So, yes. Yeah. Some nice venue there, too. I mean, we played the Olympia. I love the Olympia there. And I was, oh, yeah. We've been trying to book ourselves into the Olympia for years and years and years. Uh, and a few years ago, on the Incaud event, the last, the tour for the last time, we managed to get ourselves in there. So that's kind of, we take that box, at least. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but we love we love playing in Paris. It's it's great. It's always been great for us there for some reason. Nice, nice. How's it been touring with uh, Sammy now on drums? It's been good. He's he's been complete lifesaver, actually. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, we we were pretty early about to going out on tour, uh, right when the pandemic started to fade. And uh, I mean, we were one of the one of the first bands to to go over from Europe to to the to North America, um, and it was a bit risky. I mean, all it took back then was just one in the whole touring party be, being sick, and you risk, you know, cancellations and stuff like that. Sure, yeah. Uh, but Sammy, of course, he lives in Stockholm. He's been working with us anyways as a. Uh, a tech drum tech and a keyboard tech and he's, he's just the most reliable guy ever i think and we asked him and he said sure i'll, I'll help you out and he did a great job he did did that change the dynamics maybe not just on stage playing but also you know out of the yeah stage. i mean of course i mean it was what like what happened with with axe was something that was very unfortunate mm -hmm. and it wasn't, you know, none, like I was, none, none would be more miserable about that than, than I was then, you know, because mm -hmm. I love acts. Um, but uh, I mean, what happened, happened. He's not, uh, he, he wouldn't, he, he didn't do those tours that we, that we had booked, you know, so we, we needed someone to fill in and that guy became Sammy. And of course it was, I mean, we were a band mourning in a way. <laughs> Uh, and at the same time, we had a job to do. Sure. Um, sure. That's why we're so horrendous, you know, super, super thankful towards Sammy for, for stepping, because it's like stepping in with OPEF, it's not, it's not easy. 
it's pretty, right, I yeah. think, you know, from people that I've played with, it's like, it's, oh, it's difficult, you know, because it's so dynamic, the music <laughs> that we play. Um, yeah, it's difficult. And even he, Sami is a very accomplished drummer that comes a bit from, from the fusion, uh, fusion rock type world. Uh, and even he said that it's difficult. It's not easy. I'd imagine, yeah. Definitely. How was your um, your experience at the la the latest uh, Hellfest festival? I mean, I've seen you there. I've seen part of your show there. Yeah, I mean, it was warm. Yeah, uh, it was. Yeah. It was. Uh, I mean, the show itself was a bit of a relief from the heat, actually, because I mean, backstage there was there was no way to get away from the heat there. Uh, the dressing rooms, were, they were like ovens, pretty much. Yeah. Uh, the catering area, it was like a sauna. Uh, so being on stage, I mean, it wasn't cool or anything. It was just super hot. So we, we basically just went on there and did, did our thing and went off and kind of, so, you know, stuck around the bus where we at least had some air conditioning. Mm -hmm. So unfortunately, I mean, it was a vast, big big crowd there and they had water cannons and I felt for them you know being out in that heat I mean of course I'm always happy when people show up to see us play for sure, for sure. but I would certainly understand if they would have hid in the shade <laughs> you know what I mean you know I, I wouldn't be so dedicated to any band in that heat it was, <laughs> it was pretty extreme yeah it was pretty crazy right but it how was. did you feel about the festival? Because you played you played a festival a few times now. Many times. Yeah, I think we played the very first Hellfest, actually. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Uh, and they have always treated us nice. I mean, we were there when it was a, a small festival in the beginning. Mm -hmm. And now it's, if it's not the biggest metal festival in um, Europe or the world, it's one of the biggest. You know, it lasted for, what, two, two three weeks this time around? It, yeah, it's got a couple of weeks. Yeah, it's super big, you know. But they like you you tend to be, get a bit anonymous in on festivals of that size. Right. And yeah, we were one of a million bands playing there, but for some reason, you know, uh we have we 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 were there for the first Hellfest ever and we were there for the latest one and i think they have a, a good vibe about us they keep inviting us in there and we always try to do our best so i, I do i do really like that festival but like i said it's uh, it's it there's a tendency of that you you'll get a bit invisible on these yeah, yeah. massive festivals you're just another band stepping on a stage if you know what i mean mm -hmm. But with that said, I still I still think uh, those big festivals. I mean, we play most of those, like the Vakens and the the Hellfests and what have you, um, a billion times over the years. And we keep coming back. It's always nice to take care of you. The food's good. And the hospitality is good. And there's a lot of people coming out. And good opportunity for a pretty um how do you say difficult I mean, we 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 we're not kind of crowd pleasing type band if you know what i mean we're uh, yeah pretty much an acquired taste and that if they keep us keep inviting us there is something that we're of course very happy with and we can maybe be exposed to some fans who never heard us before so that's why you do those things yeah absolutely i mean you could see the eclecticism even in the crowd you see the the lineup is pretty you know it's quite all over the place but even the the crowd some tourists you know some people just roaming around yeah. checking bands from black metal to punk to you know prog to whatnot so yeah, yeah no, it's, it's, uh, it's great i mean that diversity that they have i mean it's, it's second to none basically there's so many different genres and bands gathering up over the course of whatever two weeks or whatever they had there mm -hmm. but uh, you pre so you prepare differently for like uh let's call it your own show your own gig right for your people let's say do you have I this mean, set list that is more you know broader or you just play you just you know 
approach the I don't show. know what that would be, to be honest. You know, like if we had that type of criticism before that they should play some more mainstreamy songs or mm-hmm. whatever, like crowd please. And I'm like, what songs are that? I'm not sure, <laughs> sure what that would be. I mean, we don't we never had a hit single. Um and I mean we have we have like within our little camp, we have songs that we think are a bit more so to speak famous songs than other songs of course mm-hmm. songs like deliverance songs like ghost of perdition yeah with no pain and whatever but um uh i mean i even if we we want to play a good show for the people who love us who are already fans but if you hear us for the first time i'm not sure if it makes a difference what songs we that's play. true that's true that's true well, you fall into a particular genre of, uh, like you said before, it's not really the crowd-pleasing sort of song structure that, you know. No, it's not they, jumpy. Jump up and down and, you know. Jumpy, yeah. That's a good most one. Hit type music, even if we have that too. Um, but we, we're simply not one of those bands. I mean, we've just been very fortunate in that sense that we can play our very weird, strange type of music that change, changed a lot of you know a lot over the years and uh, and that there's still like an audience for us and that we still get invited to any festivals to be honest you know it's it's we feel very fortunate that we are you know it's it's hard to kind of pigeonhole us in a way i guess you know we 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 are in a different genre i mean sometimes we're a death metal band or a whatever prog metal band <laughs> uh, but all in all it's 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 so diverse that I could easily understand why nobody would want to listen to us. You know what I mean? <laughs> because it's, yeah, I mean, you, ne- you never know where you have us, so to speak. How do you feel about the moniker, the prog moniker? Seems these days, like anything longer than seven minutes is just thrown into the prog, you know? If you don't have a song structure, a, a classical strong st- structure, you're automatically categorized as prog something. How do you feel about that? Yeah, I don't mind it. I mean, it's just uh, some tight. I mean, you, you tend to be kind of um, band like us. We, we've we been called pro. I think we started calling ourselves prog metal, actually, early, early on. Uh, but we, we also we, we, we kind of lumped in with with some of these like more modern bands. Um, like, um, uh, you know, like um, Leprous and uh, mm-hmm. Tesseract, and they're great people, great bands, and all that stuff, you know. And, and I would say that they're progressive. Yes, I would. Um, but there's also like, like when the difference I make between prog, the prog, uh, the genre, and prog, the music is for me like progressive music means uh, pushing forward, using a lot of different genres in one. Uh, form of music uh, while prog metal is almost like a style mm-hmm. if you know, know, know what I mean about the difference you know like uh, I grew up with I mean the, mo- the most modern prog metal band I've heard are uh, Queen Strike, Dream Theater and Fate's Warning right right <laughs> I don't really keep track of, of all the others even if we play with some of them and some are really really good bands I would say mm-hmm. uh, but like dream theater of course they in turn for me when i heard them the first time i was like oh it's like a heavier version of yes exactly I i thought that was super cool and that was pretty or very rare in those days and queen strike of course they have i mean they're not technically super advanced but the song structures and this the difference between the songs and the dynamics of that band is something uh, that I think made them stand on their own, if you know what I mean. And you couldn't really compare them to their peers at the time. They didn't sound like anyone else. That's true. I think. And that's what we, where we wanted, what we wanted to be. Only that we had gone the, so to speak, extra mile in metal, and and we come from a death metal um, background. So that was the the mixture for us. You know, I was heavily into Dream Theater and Queen Strike. I still am. Uh, but I also started record collecting, picking up, picking up these old bands, and then we had the death metal roots, and we just mel- you know blended those two, and that became Opeth. 
and at the time, I mean, yeah, pre- maybe people said prog metal about us, and maybe I said that too. Uh, but I don't feel that comfortable that we belong to that uh, contemporary genre of today. Right, right. That's what I meant. But, really, is, is because yeah. of the, the the you know the spectrum of today is pretty different than let's say fifteen, even twenty years ago. Yeah, I think I think we're different, but I'm not like I I, I wouldn't be like no, we're fuck no, we're not prog metal. You know, that's <laughs> fine with me. You know, it doesn't matter. You know, we'd be yeah, yeah, yeah. under the sun. Uh, but yeah, it's it doesn't really it doesn't really say much anymore. When when people talk about contemporary prog metal, it's it's what I think is usually like pretty flashy musicians mm-hmm. who you know fat like have seven, eight, nine string guitars. Right, right. Yeah. And they play like fast solos and really really technical songs uh and uh odd time signatures and that kind of stuff you know that's what i think of Mm -hmm. and we don't really i mean we have some of that stuff but that's never been the style really for us right never like with a few on a few occasions we try to be a bit more technical in the past uh but i think we're we're almost almost like a regressive (laughs) metal band now you know we, we we tend to sink deeper into like i don't know grotto music well you want to simplify you don't want to complicate things for the sake of complicating things i think no i always valued a good song you know like a a simple song more than more than like technical aspect which i also think is super cool but i've heard so much about it it's i don't know where to start so i mean at the end of the day even if i i admire some great musicians who are much better players than all of us Mm -hmm. um my first uh, interest in music ultimately kind of boils down to the quality of the song as opposed to the quality of the musicianship. Right, right. So now switching back to your work with uh, Jonas. Yes. For Clark, which I uh, finished watching last week, actually. <laughs> what do you think? Yeah, I love it. I love all the yavla, yavla, yavla. It reminded me of my... Uh, <laughs> Our years in, in England with the Swedes. <laughs> yeah, no, it's uh, it, it's funny. You know, it was voted as a as like top comedy or something on some film award or you know here in Sweden recently. And I turned to my girlfriend, oh, is that a comedy? And she said, like, yeah, it's a comedy. So, <laughs> uh, it is super funny, but it's like the weird thing about the Clark is that most of those things really happen. Right, right. Yeah. You know these bizarre events. You know, then of course, I mean, the Clark, the character in the series, is more distorted than the actual Clark. Sure, yeah, 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 it's a cartoonesque for, version, almost of the real. Uh... Definitely, you know, for entertainment's sake. Um, but many of those events actually happen. You know, so the story is bizarre mm-hmm. as it is. And Bill did a great job. I think he was. It's superb in that role. Bill is brilliant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so weird. I met. I met. I went to the to the shoot and um, sat in when they filmed that scene where he's shitting out, uh, uh, you know, some money. <laughs> oh, yeah, <laughs> yes, I saw that when they filmed that scene. Uh, and I met the guy. And he's so young, and you know, he was in in a in the beard and you know the you know in character. Like, yes, yeah, in character, but like. When I talked to him, he was back to just being Bill, the guy. I right. was like, oh my God, he's, he's so fucking young. You know? But when he starts acting, it's like he's 10 years older and authority and all that kind of stuff. You know? So that was, no, I, I, I really like the series. It's hugely entertaining and, uh, you know, one of the funniest things I've ever been involved in. I think it's the biggest. Uh... I'm not sure about that, but I think it might be the biggest uh, Netflix Swedish production or the first one or something. It would have to be. I mean, At least the, fir- the first one that really hits, you know, internationally that way. Yeah. Now, uh, Jonas was really pleased. I mean, networking with Netflix is, of course, I never worked with them before. And it was a lot of b- bureaucracy and red tape and all that kind of stuff. And <laughs> some 
things that they uh, needed and wanted uh, that is like, why? <laughs> you don't understand all of it, you know? But I'm kind of used to it, having worked with a lot of record labels where, right. you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. where they ask you to do a specific thing and you go, why? And they say, well, just because. And it's like, okay, yeah, whatever. So, you, you know, you just have to kind of adjust and adapt, I guess. Yeah, a little bit of confidence. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. And Jonas was was really happy with the the attention. That, I mean, of course, in Sweden, it got a lot of attention, you know. But also overseas, I don't think we had a Swedish production on that became so uh, internationally known, you know. But it was, yeah, it was it was a big big thing, you know. And and I'm super proud and happy that I was part of it if only writing some of the music and that's the first time you 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 write um scoring for a movie or for a tv series right yeah yeah it is um i i did help like a friend of mine was studying like a, a university studying film went to film school and he asked me to write a um, thing for his short film but that was of course on a zero budget and very uh, amateur you know, uh, but that was fun too. It was eight years ago. But uh, for as a real thing, this was my first experience with with working with film. It's big, I mean, Jonas. I'm not sure. He he said to me that he 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 immediately thought of me to do this because we we spent some time together and we had dinner and drinking beers and listening to metal or whatever what we do when we hang out and as you and, do uh, yeah as you do i mean it's it's really like he's 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 great jonas very down to earth um and uh straight to the point too you know it's like it's not it's not fuzzing around if you know what i mean so that's mm -hmm. he simply just asked me and i was like yeah of course <laughs> How did you approach the, uh, but did you start working on the project before they had the material or would you yeah. it after? Yeah. Yeah. I started right away when he asked me, I mean, he, at the time he didn't have any, the scripts were being written. So they, they, uh, they didn't have anything to show me, but of course, Clark is a well-known character in Sweden anyways. Right. right. And he said that it's going to be a biopic of sorts and it's starting when he's born and, you know, into the future. So I, I and since I know about Clark and I know some of that, his, his story before I even read the script and did my homework, so to speak, I could just start basically. So I started pretty much right away. And then, of course, the pandemic hit, which was perfect timing for me in order to be able to finish this project. So I ended up writing so much music. You know, eventually I got the scripts and could read them and I got some footage too, so I could to write to the footage. Mm -hmm. um, but I did, I wrote so much music, uh, uh, a hundred songs, I think, like over a hundred songs and I don't know, seven, six, seven, eight hours of music or something for that. Wow. Uh, but I had nothing better to do. <laughs> I wasn't at home. <laughs> so you've got you've got a, a volume two for for season two, then because the the soundtrack is about not even half of that, right? No, no, no. Uh, as, as, uh, that was really a case of killing your darling, so to speak. You know? Right, right. I had right. A lot of music that I wanted to get on the soundtrack, but you know, of course, it's you know, for me to put out a, a quadruple vinyl, you know. <laughs> uh, I don't think the record label would be that interested, so it just became a double vinyl. But yeah, I have shitloads of material that um, first that wasn't used in the film. Secondly, that didn't end up on the soundtrack. Okay, okay. How did you? How did you? What's the inspiration? Did you look for like childhood? You know, the Swedish era when you grew up. Yeah, to, yeah, to a certain extent, like. For for the 40s, like the first episode, when a lot of it takes place in the 40s, when yeah. Clark is born, mm -hmm. I had to kind of do my homework a little bit and listen to music from the 40s and music in films from the 40s. What did it sound like? And especially Swedish films. Uh, and that was like, you know, really doing, you know, like kind of, I don't know, dancey 
kind of old, just old sounding music, you know, that yeah. I wasn't really familiar with. And uh, yeah, I did a few takes of, of that type of music. And then onwards on 50s, I, at least I could incorporate some some like bebop or modal type jazz right, music. Right, right, right. Yeah. The 50s. And then into the 60s, it became easier and easier. And 70s, of course, I was in, you know, in my mom's backyard, so to speak. It was easy for me to write that, that type of stuff. And then, of course, going into the 80s, I was looking into 80s kind of new romantics pop music and and uh, yeah i got inspiration from all over the place to be honest but i'm pretty old myself now so i've i watched shitloads of series i listened to shitloads of music from many different eras and genres so i had a little bit of knowledge about what i what what i wanted to do uh, it was just just the 40s was was difficult and then for me to produce jazz music on my own and i can't play the fucking saxophone right. so i have to fix you know i have to really you know i produced everything in my cellar here in my house uh, and it's just me playing so that was like of course a challenge to make it sound somewhat authentic if you know what i mean but uh, I mean, it, people were happy. So Jonas was happy, and the, the pr- pr- production team were happy, and Netflix were happy. So then I was happy. For sure, for sure. So did you do everything in your in your house? In the cellar, yeah. Nice. Uh, are there <laughs> are there in Stockholm? Yes, in Stockholm, in the suburbs of Stockholm. Confinement, confined home, just uh, learning forties. Uh, that's nice. Yeah. Right? That's what it was. I mean, I bought a, a new, like, a, what's it called? Like a, um, what do you say? Sound card? Like a... a For the computer. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah you know, to, in order to... And it was so good. And it was, like, pretty uh, um, easy to work with and easy to learn. And I bought some, like, new Mellotron plugins so I could fake the saxophone sounds and the flutes and, you know, all that kind of stuff. And just do it, basically produce everything um, here. You know, everything is is done, written and recorded and mixed in my cellar. Uh, and with that said, I always intended, depending on what the budget was, that I was going to re-record everything again with the uh, proper musicians. So what, what you hear in the series and on the soundtrack are virtually their, their demos, actually. And because they were so happy with the demos, I was like, well, should I do it again or not? And they said, no, let's keep it. And I'm so like, that's, okay, that's, so. that's pretty cool, man. That's amazing, man. Yeah, just a Great. second. It's a call. Yeah, sure, sure. Hey, Eskling. Oh, she hang up. I'm just going to call her back to see if there's just a second. Hey, jag sitter i en intervju, var därför jag var lite trött. Var det något? Var, var det något? Okej. Okay. Okej. Okay. Jag ringer dig. I'm back. <laughs> so what's, uh, what's the process like, for example, for scoring? How different is it to composing for, let's say, Opeth? Or obviously the style is different, but do you approach it differently or do you just lock yourself in and get everything ready and just let it flow? Yeah, pretty much. I mean, Jonas said to me from the get-go, just like just write songs like you normally do, but to have Clark in mind and the story in mind and the different uh, eras in mind. And I figured, yeah, okay. So, you know, I didn't really write any, you know, 10, 15 minute songs because I figured they're gonna, you know, chop it up. And, you know, so I, I would rather yeah, yeah. have a lot of different genres like short uh, short pieces of music that covered a lot of ground and if they wanted me to expand on something i could do that and i did as well uh, so it was that was the main difference i guess that i i never really finished the songs so to speak uh, i don't i didn't i didn't view them as a song it was just like a snippet of a song more or mm-hmm. less um 
so that was the difference you know normally i sit around with with a song and i want a perfect beginning and a perfect middle part and a perfect ending and all that kind of stuff and now i focus more on the perfect start and some type of um, theme you know uh, and that i didn't care so much about the ending I, I, mean, yeah. I was sure that they're going to use you know a few seconds yeah, yeah, here yeah. and if they wanted me to write something longer they could only tell me and i would i, I, I could do that later um so that's why i had so many different songs i mean they're short you know short like two three four minute pieces or something like that so it's short in comparison to what i do with opeth right, right, but generally right. I, I just i just wrote music you know um if they had like an idea like sometimes they would call me or email me saying we need this uh, we need something for um the bank robbery scene and we want it to be kind of you know exciting and a bit kind of uh, um, uh, dramatic but also a bit flirtatious and i'm like hmm what do you mean like flirt oh yeah well, he's robbing a bank and it's exciting and it's it's a, it's a thriller but at the same time he's flirting with this girl you know and i'm like okay how the fuck do i write music like that but you know, I just, you know, did whatever I came up with. And you worked it out. out. Yeah, I did work it out somehow. I mean, as long as they were happy, I was happy. And that's also one big difference, you know. When I write for Opeth, the only person I really have to please is, is myself first, mm -hmm. then the band secondly. And here I had to kind of d d detach myself from the music in that sense that they might love something that I think is a bit run-of-the-mill, Mm -hmm. And they might hate something that I think is a it's a it's a it's a, it's a veritable masterpiece. Right. So I couldn't really control that. So I just detached myself from music and tried to deliver music that either they asked for or music that I thought was cool and could fit in a certain certain uh, time. Uh, or you know, for a specific scene, you know. So it was uh, that that was a big difference from when I write for open. Well, I guess you had to wait for their reaction to yeah, exactly. Make I mean, up that's... your money whether or not you were happy with it or not. If they were happy, well, jobs done and you know. Yeah, and of course, like you know, like there's a couple of pieces I wrote that didn't end up in the series. And I was like, oh my god, you know, that would have been perfect for that scene. They should have picked that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But you know, I'm I don't decide that. That's they decide that, you know. So I was pushing for a few things, like the theme, for instance, which opens the series. That was uh, the first piece I wrote with that in mind, thinking this could be the theme for the series. Um, and I sent it to Jonas and he's like, you know what? I love this. You know, I think this might be the theme. And that it, it ended, up, ended up being the theme, actually. And that was the very first piece of music I wrote. That's cool, man. Yeah, I was pretty happy about that, actually. Now you're looking forward to, you know, work uh, in the future, scoring, maybe collaborating on scoring a film or more TV shows. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I love that. You had a test, you know. Yeah, uh, it was, you know, it's, it's, I mean, for, for me, it was, I love being in the studio. I, I love creating music. And it doesn't necessarily, now I know it doesn't necessarily have to be for Opeth. I need some project. I, I don't write songs for fun, so to speak. Just go mm -hmm. down. I have nothing to do today. I think I'll write a song. I don't do that really. I need right, right. some like an Opeth record, we're going to record in seven months. So I'll, I'll start writing. Or a project like Clark, for instance. And I need uh, some type of uh, goal, I guess, in order to start writing. Otherwise, yeah, I don't need, really know where to start. I like, I like to work when I have, I'm working towards an already ex existing idea. Um, so uh, yeah, I love I love writing music, and so in that sense, when it comes to if somebody would ask me to write for more films or TV TV series or whatever, I would probably say yes if it was something I felt I could add something to. 
For sure. Is there any t- TV shows that you liked in the recent, you know, in the recent years? Anything that you find of, you know, quality that you liked? TV's come a long way since, uh, you know, 20 years ago. So, yeah, no, I watched, we watched shitloads of TV series. Uh, so many. Um, the Boys. I love The Boys. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, better Call Saul. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we just started watching the new Lord of the Rings thing, which I also love. Um, the classics, Breaking Bad and The Wire. Um, uh, what's that one called with Ricky Gervais? Uh, after Afterlife, yeah. Afterlife, yeah. I thought that was beautiful. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I, you know, as long as it's, you know, I, I'm, I'm pretty uh, easily entertained. <laughs> I think Easily I watch, yeah, I can watch anything from just like a, a, a like a meathead type action thing to you know intricate, complicated dramas and everything in between. Okay, I see. You know, as long as uh, uh, yeah, I, I, I'm a TV junkie in a way. You know, like I could watch TV for for ages and ages. You know, but I'm also kind of picky if I feel like. Oh, the acting is shit or the script seems rushed or yeah yeah it's hard to get into it yeah if it's not believable you know i i like the boys for instance of course i don't you know watch the boys thinking oh that's that you know that's not believable that's not uh, reality you know because yeah, yeah, yeah. Years, you know but uh, that's so kind of enthralling anyways um so i i, I watch everything basically Man, thanks so much for giving me some time today. Oh, thank you for talking to me. Oh, that was that's great. Awesome. That's awesome. I hope I'll, I'll try not to overstay my welcome so I can always uh, get invited again. Oh, definitely. Just uh, let us know and we'll, we'll sort it out. For but sure. That was great. Good, good questions. Thanks, Michael. And I'll see you, well, I'll see you from afar uh, yes. uh, in, Paris in Paris on the 16th. On the 16th of November. Yes, that's right. Yeah, that's right. Good. Awesome. We'll see you then. Have a good one and uh, talk to you soon. Cheers, man. Take care. Bye. You too. Thank you. Bye bye.